Hi guys, welcome to another How to Be an Artist Creator Profile. I am your host and facilitator, Carrie Brummer of Artists Strong, and I'm really happy to introduce you today to Anne Ruthman. And I'm going to give you kind of a brief background before she jumps in and, and shares more about her story with us. So, uh, Anne has been a self employed creative entrepreneur since 2005. She's successfully traversed the journey from hustling hard to finding creative flow and freedom, allowing her to travel the world several times times over. She's an intuitive business consultant for freelancers and creatives who want to work with a mentor who that considers personal creative and energetic flow as an important part of any business strategy. She has a TEDx talk that talks about questions and challenges she's faced on the way to finding her path. And she also has a new book, which is one reason she kind of came up on my radar. It's called Pricing Workbook for Creatives. And it's a DIY workbook of successfully tested formulas and processes for pricing creative work. So I'm really happy uh, to have Anne here. I think many of you will connect with her and her journey. So thank you, Anne, so much for being here. Thank you so much for, for inviting me. I'm so grateful to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. So tell us, uh, when did you first realize your passion for the arts? Uh, I feel like it was born within me and it was more about figuring out that I couldn't escape it. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like um, trying to follow society's advice of basically, you know, doing the smart thing or the reasonable thing or the whatever thing and realizing, no, that's, that's not going to work for me. That is not at all um, how I work or how I function. So um, for me, it was really just about discovering that this is something I have to do, and I have to find a way to do it um, in whatever way possible. And so um, in the TEDx talk, I do talk about how that unfolded. It started um, with like music at a really early age and art at a really early age and music composition and um, discovering just what the talents were that were flowing through me, what the gifts were. And then it I kind of sidetracked after um, finishing high school thinking, I needed to pursue the smart thing and then coming back to artistic pursuits through music which then took me to photography which I know sounds a little strange but that's how it happened <laughs> yeah. um, and then really identifying that that was the gift that people um, valued and I aligned with providing um, to other people as often as possible. I think it's really important for people to hear the different ways people find their path because that's that's one reason I titled this how to be an artist because I want people to see the many varied ways that people come to their art and their voice and feel empowered to trust their own journey and path and not feel like they have to fit some formula that someone's shared with them yeah yeah I agree um, so so tell us tell us more about your photography so it started out um, really is just fine art for myself I just started out like, oh, I really love playing with um, composition and playing with light and playing with shadow and all the cool techniques that you can do through photography. Um, sometimes I was trying to recreate um, an image in a photograph that I had maybe created in a painting or seen somewhere. I think a lot of artists start off mimicking things that they've seen done elsewhere as a way to develop technique and a way to develop our artistic um, voice. And from that, um, I then started needing other people to be in my photos and I started having visions of creative things that I could do for other people and so then I started offering it to them um, mainly in a portrait context or for their modeling portfolios or for their musician portfolios or their recital posters and that was really the place where I started to dig into like okay now I'm composing not just a scene or a person within a scene but the background the context how to really say something more um, about this person or about their work and then that led into commercial work through weddings and then editorial work for universities um, and so in some ways I was always trying to find a way to bring the passionate part of me into all of the commercial aspects of doing um, artistic work and so that was really how I how I navigated that that path of, of going from it just being for myself to it now being for other people in a way that I could really kind of bank on right yeah did you did you feel 
I'm kind of curious in terms of that exploration and kind of playing with different uh, approaches to photography, were they all intertwined? Did you still kind of jump back and forth between maybe some of this portrait work with, with wedding or, you know, was it kind of, was it more linear? Oh yeah, actually I loved, one of the things I loved about weddings was the on the spot creative problem solving that would happen where like when I started out, you know, I was working with people who had low budgets and I would have a cinder block room to work with. Right. <laughs> How do I make this cinder block room look fantastical and amazing and special and just so unique? And so I would turn down my exposure super dark, focus just on the DJ lighting, have all these beautiful bright lights just shine, sparkling in the distance. No one could tell that this was happening in a VFW hall. It looks so romantic and so beautiful. And so it was stuff like that that really, you know, developed my artistic eye um, and my technique for really finding how to turn what looks normal and maybe undesirable into something that's just feels beautiful and feels romantic in, the, in that context. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that makes me think about kind of journey to finding voice as a creative and how sometimes environmental situations uh, lead us in some ways to make connections and and kind of own or celebrate our voice more because we realize we want a certain uh, so how do you how would you discuss or or describe your voice as a creative um, I would definitely say that it continually changes and it's constantly evolving. So to say that I have one creative voice is a little bit of a challenge, but I can tell you that when it was in weddings, um, it was really about the beauty of place, of people, of emotional connection. Any kind of time I could find a moment of emotional connection in the room, I was so excited to bring that out and to bring that to the forefront of the image. Um, now, when my work shifted to being editorial and working with like a university to produce a lot of marketing material, it was about finding the joy. What's the joy in this moment? What's the, what's the magnetic part of this experience that makes people want to come in and enjoy this with them? And then when it switched to um, architecture and interior clients who are you know really focused on texture, light, color, design, it was about how can I create a context for this um, other creative's work in such a way that makes it um, just craveable and desirable. So I mean, I guess throughout that there's a theme of how do I make it craveable, how do I make it desirable? Um, and I would say probably for myself too, like when I create art for myself, it's like I, I'm trying to create a feeling or a sense that of something that I want to cultivate more of. Well, it sounds like there's a lot of, you know, like some artists would be described as moody in terms of the style of their work, right? And it sounds like there's a thread of joy and happiness that you, you connect in all of the things you do. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I um, I have created work that's a little bit darker, but it required me to be in that darker place. Mm -hmm. um, and I know now how to get there if I need to create it, but I'm definitely more of a like optimism, you know, kind of perspective. <laughs> yeah. Uh. I really am happy to hear uh, another, yet another artist uh, in these conversations say that um, my voice is constantly evolving because that's again uh, this like reinforcement message that I know that my community needs to hear because they do, they feel like someone's told them that they have to have one style for their whole life to be successful and thriving or, or there's some kind of box that they're stuck in because of outside uh, kind of societal communication about, def you know, defining art uh, and, and it really bothers me that people then feel this lack of permission in some ways to be who they are uh, so you know what do you what would what advice would you offer to people who might be feeling some kind of restraint around that I think that what we do when we put those impositions on ourselves is that we are referencing entire bodies of work of people who've lived in the past and I think that we don't really understand I don't think that Monet understood his thing, what his thing was, I don't, ever. You know, I think he was constantly evolving, but 
after his life, we look at his body of work and we say, oh, these are the themes that he continually recreated over time. Yayoi Kusama, like, okay, so dots are her thing. She's really gone into dots, right? But in the beginning, maybe that, she didn't really have that as her, like, crutch, you know, like that wasn't her defined thing. She wasn't leaning into that strongly. So I think that in order to get to a place where we feel like we have any sort of definition on this huge, large body of work that we can create, we really have to play and explore. And, and I just think that's true in all arts, like jazz musicians, they start by emulating a lot of different people. They find what they like, what they don't like. Eventually through that process of, of playing and experimenting, then they start to begin to develop a voice that has some consistency to it. But it's not until we've, we've entered into all of these other spaces and found the things we like and don't like that we really, we really start to hone and refine what it is that our voice may become. And we may never know until the end of right. our life and somebody looks back and goes, oh, okay, this is the thread that they seem to have throughout their entire life, regardless of what they were making. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. There needs to be this element of faith and self-trust that uh, we feel called to create in a certain way. And there's a reason and we may never understand the reason you don't have to, but, but have a little faith that that's there and, and that's part of you and that's okay. And, and to roll with it. And, and uh, I, I mean, I can't remember which uh, artist said this, but basically someone said, let the art historians figure out what I'm saying. I'm here to make my art. Exactly. And, and, yeah. Exactly. Like, theory, the theory, art theory, or music theory, or all these types of theories, they are based on analyzing what has already happened and trying to make sense of what happened, but they're putting a framework around something that at the time did not have a framework. Right. At the time, somebody was just doing what felt natural and real and, you know, from them, from their heart, from whatever they could do. It wasn't until theorists went back and looked right. at it all that they put the box around it. <laughs> exactly, because art historians of the time, for example, with Impressionists, it was called Impressionism as an insult. They didn't even like the work. So, you know, we, again, we adhere to these these notions or ideals of what is successful art, but people making it at the time were, were not being told they were successful necessarily. Uh, so yeah, no, great, great stuff. Um, Okay, so let's kind of switch switch gears here a little bit. I'd love to hear if you have any kind of rituals around your making um, or a creative practice. What What's important to you um, in terms of creating environments or kind of the before and after of your, your making process that, that helps kind of sustain you or fuel you? Um, I feel for me, it's staying in touch with it every day. It's not limiting it to the tools that I have. Um, or that I consider my tools for creating. So a lot of people look at like using a phone camera as a downgrade, you know, or like not creating or not being artistic or not being creative. But my phone is with me all the time. And if I see something that is compelling or is, you know, really touching me in a really emotional way, I am going to use my phone as the tool that I have in that moment to capture what that is. And then if I want to translate it in another way later, I have that. I, I then have that memory or that um, documentation of what I was trying to go after. Um, so I think that staying in touch with my work in whatever way possible, you know, if I were, um, there are definitely times where I will sketch something, my phone's dead. <laughs> like, I can't take a picture. Yeah. I'm like, okay, what do I have? I have like a <laughs> napkin and a, where's a pen or pencil, right? <laughs> and so it's really like, allowing allowing those inspirational creative moments to happen at any moment any time they're not reserved for a special room they're not reserved for a special time and i think that is really the strongest ritual for me that keeps me constantly in creative flow i think that's such a great point that when i when i have personal distance from my work that's when the thinking or overthinking can get in the way where if I show up every day and regularly put um, gold leaf or paint to my canvas I know I feel more grounded and more connected to what I'm doing and there's less of that inner critic getting in the way or preventing me from showing up um, you know and it can be little simple things like you say you know having a little sketchbook by your bed using your phone to capture those moments you see but art isn't just the moment of the making either it's it's viewing the world through the lens of an artist and and looking at daily things that happen in your life in an artful way. Yeah, great stuff. Yeah, yeah, I agree on that. 
Uh, what advice do you wish you had when you first started out making your work? Um, I think I think a lot of the things that, you know, we talked about, letting it be a process of unfolding, letting it be unpredictable, letting it be inspired, letting it not have to live in a box. Um, Cause I know I struggled with those feelings as well in the beginning. Um, a lot of people ask you, what's your style? And I'm like, can you tell me, I'll go look at my, <laughs> 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 yeah. what kind of style do you see? <laughs> Right. You know, eventually I learned um, what my motivations were, and that was a little easier to talk about, or what moments or things inspired me to create, because that also is that place of um, of where you uncover what that is. And so I think if people had asked me the right questions, which mm -hmm. were, what inspires you to create? Um, what motivates you to put this in a format that can be shared with others? Um, I might have had those answers maybe a little earlier and a little clearer. And um, so I think that, that those, those questions are maybe a little more helpful. And nobody was asking me those questions in the beginning, um, but they're questions that I've learned over time are more, the more meaningful questions. Yeah, great point. Yeah. Yeah, again, uh, you know, like asking someone what is your style is really putting someone in a box again. We we do it by, by it's like human nature. We want to be able to put people in these little boxes as if that will help us better understand them, right? Well, you fit in yeah. this box, so this is how I know you then. And that's, of course, when we can also have conflict, when we start to shift the way we view or see the world and we don't fit in their box and then they try to put us back in there, right? Like that's that's kind of the dynamic I see for people who choose to start dabbling in art or, or um, have decided art is a hobby now after they've retired or they're done caregiving they they all of a sudden have this opportunity and then people will say things like oh how nice you have this new hobby or they do it but in, in this in this way that feels denigrating to the new per you know this person who's newly discovering themselves so uh, such a wonderful point to say like let's ask the right questions and and let's just be okay with if someone asks us the wrong question that's them that's not you that's their box like you don't have to you don't have to take that on yourself. And and maybe maybe it's an opportunity for us to redirect the question. You say, you know, I think a better question to ask me would be what's my inspiration or or what's motivated the shift in my life? And that would create a more meaningful conversation with the person who's asked that question to begin with. Exactly. Too. Yeah. And that's that's so much more connectable and relatable. And, you know, also the question of um, I think, you know, what themes are you exploring right now, right? Like, what are the themes that are driving you? Um, you know, and if depression is a theme, hey, work it. Because yeah. art is one of the best ways to work it. So it's, it's so many things um, that come from that place of connecting with the feeling um, that we're leaning into or exploring or the moment, yeah, I think is a better way to approach it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Amen, my friend. <laughs> oh. So it's so interesting because the majority of our conversation has been more about feeling, connecting to our work, how we connect with others, kind of that um, more spiritual, intuitive way that art is part of our lives. And yet I know you have a new book out all about pricing. <laughs> which that doesn't, you know, like, and so I think it can totally be aligned, but like on surface level, people might not always see that connection. Would you, would you tell me how this came about? So um, the, the work was inspired by being in the industry, being in the photography industry and the creative industry and seeing um, just a lot of people not valuing themselves and understanding that we have to come from a place of valuing ourselves And all this mindset work that's out there right now, it's helpful to get over some of the self barriers. Um, but what I found was that when people just did like point blank worksheets, that, 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 this is what I need. This is what my creative tools are. These are the things that I need to pursue. They developed a sense of self worth that was kind of like indestructible. <laughs> what I found was that a lot of mindset practices were taking people, you know, like they would, it would be a cycle of like getting really high in following somebody's, you know, like motivation to get them to try something and then a big crash when it wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. oh, well, that's really frustrating for creatives. And sure. so I wanted to create um, a, like a 
defined worksheet style system that was kind of like building brick by brick a wall of value for creativity that could not be argued with. Um, and that really came out of just seeing people go through that cycle of like inspiration and destruction, inspiration and destruction, and feeling like there's a better way. There is a better way. And it did come out of my business training before I uh, went to pursue art full time. And it also came out of the business training inspired by the idea that all of the business advice that's out there right now is terrible for creative work. It's just terrible. And it's based on these 19th century models of devaluing one human in order to provide profit for another human. And so I'm really um, railing against these <laughs> older systems and ways of thinking about pricing work and pricing creative work. And so that was really why I was like, okay, I have to create this book. If I do nothing else in life, if I die tomorrow, I feel like I will leave the world in a better place <laughs> if I just create this pricing workbook. And I really wanted it to be applicable across as many creative fields as possible. So there's a lot of open-ended parts of it. And I also put a lot of work-life balance elements into it as well so that people could understand um, what it would take to reach their goals, but then also understand what would be burnout because that was another thing that I saw um, regularly in the creative industries was that um, people would, you know, feel that they needed to just have more and more and more and more sales. Well, that's a great way to burn out if you aren't planning for what is enough and what is growth. What does growth look like after you've reached enough? How do you plan for that? How do you negotiate that space? And so it also kind of has a formula for going from a place of sustainability to a place of growth by putting meaning into profit, which is often something that um, people see as profit as something nebulous that you don't really need, but it's great to have. But I actually decide, you know, in the book, no, it is meaningful. You do need it. Here's why you need it. Now let's plan for it and let's create a way to put it into um, the prices that you're going to have on your offers. So it was a way for me to really like reduce a lot of the anxiety that comes with pricing. Um, it was a way for me to say, for everybody who has that question, how should I price this? Hey guys, here you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do this, I think you'll get the answer out of this. <laughs> and it came Great. through consulting with a lot of other creatives. Um, and I'm really so glad that I had that experience because if I had only had my own experience, I would think that everybody else understood this work, but it really came became clear that it's it's stuff that feels basic, but people aren't actually doing, and so they still have all these questions out there. And such a great point that so much of this comes from mindset and, and thus we can be scared to even look at numbers and, and really think of ourselves in terms of a value or worth in terms of the products or services we might create for people and and having some kind of system to go, okay, let's, let's separate it from me and my self-worth and let's look at some numbers on paper. And then in the long run, it, of course, it comes back to reinforcing our self-worth. Yeah. But, but, yeah. but taking that step to distance ourselves from thinking about our art or creative practice as uh, it's not like we're putting a number on ourselves. We get to put a number on the things we're making and, and then make sure that feels aligned with our spirit um, instead of having it kind of so heavily intertwined with our, our identity, which can be somewhat limiting. You know, it's a shame we don't want... I want people to feel empowered to be who they are as they are and really celebrate what they want to be making. So it sounds like this would be a wonderful tool to help people really figure that out for themselves. Like what is their goal? Um, yeah. we, we, we have, so in this community, we have artists who are interested in being professional or who are, but we also have kind of half the community who identify as self-taught and maybe are um, enjoying art as a hobby and might be thinking about kind of, selling their work either to cover costs of their hobby or or dabbling with the idea of being more professional um i'm kind of curious do you have any suggestions or or how they might use this workbook to help them suss themselves you know kind of use it for as a tool of self-reflection or or empowerment yeah i think that um one of the things that i try to outline in the beginning of the workbook is to approach even if you're working in a part-time way or as a hobby to approach doing the work as if you were to build a full-time life out of this. And the reason being is because we, a lot of the supports that we rely on if we're in a part-time place with this may not always be there, right? 
Like at this point, we're not even sure if social security is going to be here in 10 years. So, right. Right. <laughs> so I tried to set people up in a way that says, look, if you approach this, at least from a professional perspective at the beginning, regardless of whether you choose to go that route, doesn't matter. But if you approach it from that perspective, you will be building in all the tools and all the figures and all the things that you need to support yourself doing this well into the future, regardless of what supports in your life are changing. Because like, if we don't have those supports built in for our creative work, then we stop doing our creative work. And so I really find it very important that even if people come from a part-time or a hobby perspective, that they approach it um, with that professional eye so that they can sustain it well into the future. Yeah. And I really like the idea as well. Um, I try to convey for, for those who want to sell and promote their art, I want them to, but I want people who are on the fence to really be able to make a decision that's right for them. So going through a workbook like this, not only will it help you see what you'd need to do to kind of reach that status of, of having sustaining income, but also help you then really decide, is this what I want to be doing with my art? Yes. It can really help you make that informed decision so that you're not always wondering, well, am I holding myself back because I'm nervous about all of this transition? Or is this something I know is just a place of kind of joy and play and, and I want to keep it that way and I don't want, I don't want to uh, pursue it professionally. Um, I think that'd be a great way to really help some people suss out whether, whether that's the right path for them or not. Definitely. And I will say my own journey, I have gone through, you know, thinking I wanted to be a professional musician or professional performer and reaching that place of seeing what it would take to be a professional performer and going, oh, yeah, I really don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so then deciding, OK, well, this is still a passion of mine. It's still an expression that needs to come out of me. How will I be doing it in a way that still fulfills my life? Um, but maybe I'll be doing it on a volunteer basis so that I am not required to do the rigor that comes with doing it professionally. But then, you know, it also helped me see that, yeah, I love the rigor of the professional photography world. And I love the rigor that comes with that. And I'm mm. so happy to do that. Um, although I will say I just retired in order to travel the world for a while. <laughs> <laughs> and I really, I had to announce it as a retirement so that my, I had a lot of recurring clients uh, so that they would really get the message that they needed to find somebody else for a while. Yep. Um, <laughs> So this that I could fair. go and travel the world a little um, handcuff free mm -hmm. <laughs> from them. Um, but I love them dearly. And uh, so, yeah, it's one of those things that's like, you know, you see you see the work that's involved when you start doing the work. And that helps you discover where you are with it, hobby wise, professional wise. Yeah. yeah. And then still lets you keep evolving. Yeah. which is always part of the journey, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and there's so many things that, you know, I'm taking this um, little trip to really get into that space of like opening myself up to all the new creative opportunities that are ahead of me um, by releasing the creative opportunities that have been behind me. Um, and so we'll see what happens. How yeah. very exciting. Constantly evolving. <laughs> I think that's a great message. So, uh, kind of tied to that then, I'd love to ask our final question today, which is, what does it mean to you to be an artist? To express our soul constantly yeah. through anything we do, anything we touch, any people we talk to, to just be in full expression of that creative soul. Thank you, Anne, for being here. I really appreciate you and your time. Thank you. Guys, thank you for watching another episode of How to Be an Artist Creator Profile. Um, I'll make sure that all of Anne's links, she's got all kinds of wonderful resources to offer you, are below this video once we're done recording so that you can follow Anne as she uh, travels the world and explores new options in her life. And I hope to see you all again on another How to Be an Artist Creator Profile. Bye, everyone. <laughs>